Charles Darwin was incredibly interested in beetles. He spent his whole life studying beetles. He did other things as well. And his very last um, uh, publication, this very last publication, was a letter to nature in which it, the title is there on the dispersal of freshwater bivalves. What had happened was a man called Crick had sent him, he was also a beetle fanatic, had sent him a beetle which had a mollusk, small bivalve, um, attached to its hind leg. The reason that they were interested in this, well, Darwin was very interested, as you know, in isolation and species change, and so, and Crick was also interested in dispersal. And so that was the reason for their, their paper. And they talked about two modes of dispersal. First of all, uh, active dispersal, where, for example, a bird migrates, uh, or, or organisms that move by themselves, and passive dispersal, in which the organism is transported by other means, either physical or, or, or by other organisms. So now, you, you probably puzzled as to why I'm talking about this, and I'm going to keep puzzling you. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of history. You can see this. It's a graveyard, isn't it? A cemetery. Um, you can see that there are gravestones. And notice that they're all the same size, the same shape. Uh, and I'll come to that later. And I'm sure you all know that that's a Culex trap. It's a trap. I should introduce myself. I, I work on mosquitoes and mosquito-borne diseases. And it's a trap that I devised for collecting gravid female Culex of a species that transmits uh, St. Louis encephalitis, a viral disease of birds. And so I'd, I'd produced this trap specifically for those species um, because that was important um, for me. And then in 1982, gosh, it's a long time ago. In 1982, I, I was working in Memphis, Tennessee on this disease. Uh, and I had a great surprise. I was, I was collecting large numbers uh, of uh, mosquitoes and sending them to a poor technician who had to sort them all. I think there were 30,000 in, in the first year. Uh, and he called me in the evening and said, you'll never guess what uh, I found. I found an Aedes albopictus. And uh, Aedes albopictus, I knew, was a species, an important vector species, uh, certainly of chikungunya and dengue viruses, if you know what they are. And uh, the, the, so this was an Asian species, never before seen uh, on the, in the, the Western Hemisphere or indeed in Europe or Africa. It was an Asian species that extends, its distribution extends from way up in China, north of Beijing and North Korea, right down into the tropical regions. So this was the Asian tiger mosquito. It's now called the Asian tiger mosquito. And I think some of you already recognize the name. So of course, the question was, how did it get there? How on earth did it get to Memphis, Tennessee? And because in those days, uh, there wasn't a web. There was, the, the only newspaper was the Mem Memphis Commercial Appeal, which wasn't a very appealing uh, journal. Uh, you could go and get the New York Times on a Sunday if you went into town to one shop. Uh, and well, there was only television really that, that helped. And, and so obviously the first thing was an airplane. Did it come in an airplane? Well, Memphis International Airport did have bi-weekly flights to the Cayman Islands. There weren't any other international flights. Um, the military were involved in Guatemala and such, but the, mos the mosquito didn't exist there as we assumed. On a ship perhaps or in a cargo. Well. I was not a very good student, and my father was enraged when I told him I was going to be a deckhand on a, on a cargo ship. Uh, and, and I spent quite some time working as a deckhand, uh, first of all on, on uh, Norwegian boats uh, going to Norway and then, then down to the West Indies and South America. And in those days, there again it seems a long time ago, the great majority of cargoes were loaded or unloaded on pallets, as you can see here in this picture. <coughs> And once they were unloaded on these pallets to the dockside, then uh, somebody took them on a forklift truck, usually, moved them to a storage area, and then from the storage area uh, to a truck or a, a, a train, etc. A very long process. So for a sailor, not for me, but for a sailor, um, the, the life 
um, was uh, in port. Uh, in fact, it was very hard work. We, we were in the hold a lot of the time, very sweaty in the tropics, uh, loading pallets, and, and, uh, but of course, um, the sailor's life, they were in ports for weeks, very often. They had time to enjoy other things. Um, and then this is the way that, uh, that cargoes are shipped today, in containers. This is quite an old um, uh, photograph, um, but even in, in the mid-1980s, it was coming to the high technology that, that, that exists today. Uh, and, and essentially, all cargoes are shipped in boxes, and, and that's the reason why uh, you can buy... Uh, you can buy Sri Lankan beer in, in uh, Paris, uh, or you can buy, as I once found, uh, uh, they were shipping frog legs uh, from uh, Bangladesh to, to Texas. And these, the containers are loaded very quickly, and so there's a great change in, in the life of the sailor. In fact, a lot of ships have the, the sailors with their, with their wives traveling above them, so obviously things have changed. You can't really inspect the cargoes. The guy on the left, he doesn't look very happy. And, and even if you want to, you would have to unload the whole, the whole container, which obviously isn't very practical. And the problem is getting bigger. Uh, this, I believe, it's actually a, a, a port in, in Bremerhaven or, or in Hamburg. But you can see, not very easy to inspect all those cargoes. A couple of years or three years after that first Alba Pictus, it turned up in Houston, Texas in Harris County, an incredible infestation. And so we all went to the sort of top uh, people and mosquitoes in, 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 uh, in the States. We all went to various places. This was a tire dump, and there were lots of mosquitoes. That's me, actually, there. Um, uh, uh, there was a tire dump, and all of the tires had the mosquito breeding in them. This is a tree-hole breeding mosquito that loves to breed in tires. Well. Oh, I should go back here. I, I gave things away. Um, what I then, that evening, the, the second evening that I was there, um, and I'd been marking tires and finding out how many mosquitoes they were producing and silly things that entomologists do. Uh, when I saw a couple of guys, it was sort of getting dark, a couple of guys drive in a pickup truck to my tires, the ones, uh, and start loading, inspecting and loading some on, on a truck. And... Well, in, in Houston, Texas, you don't really like to sort of go around in the dark in that kind of an area. But they were just two little guys, and I went and asked them what they were doing, and they said, oh, our company ships them to Guatemala and, and Mexico. And I thought, oh, that's terrible, because dengue is endemic in, in, in that. And so I said, well, wh where, where do you get the tires from? You can't have enough just by... So they said, <coughs> well, we import them from uh, India. Uh, imported used tires from India. So uh, it turned out that they were being imported from Japan. The, 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 the trader that I went to <coughs> was very suspicious of me. First of all, an Englishman driving a federal truck and interested in, in used tires. So, so um, but in the end, I went to the, to the documentation of the, of the export, uh, import export, I forgot what it's called, Department of Trade. And sure enough, there was an incredible trade global trade in used tires. The Japanese were exporting at that time to 137 countries, probably a lot more now. The US was exporting to many uh, countries as well and importing to many. You have to realize not only car tires and truck tires, but airplane tires and, and heavy machinery tires, usually for recapping, for retreading, especially the valuable, the airline. And so they have to be shipped in different places. And they're also used in some poorer countries as as fuel, uh, for example, in, in, in uh, well, I'll come to that actually. So in the Dominican Republic, um, I, I was sent there by the World Health Organization to check out because the, the, the trade data had shown to me that in fact virtually every tire in the Dominican Republic uh, was a used tire that had been imported. And in fact, I didn't find it that, but I found that uh, this, there were many tires. This was a British tire. This one is obviously an extinct species. It was made in the GDR. <laughs> this was an interesting one. These were snow tires. You can see the, the, the tungsten studs. Then it hasn't snowed in, in the Dominican Republic for a long time. And there was one made in France, I use it. So this was a distribution of Alba Pictus in 2004. I should have really put a more up-to-date one. 
Um, and in fact, now it extends right up to, uh, into Massachusetts. It's now in 21 countries in Europe. It's even across the border, I believe, into Germany. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's uh, moving rapidly across the south of France. It's in a large portion of coastal areas in Spain. Um, my group in, in Bucharest in Romania have just found it there. Another group in Czech Republic, of et cetera, et cetera. So it's moving everywhere. <clears throat> It's also in at least four countries in Africa. It's been responsible for transmission of dengue and chikungunya in, in some West or Central African states, etc., etc. It's everywhere. My mosquito, that one mosquito, and now I've conquered the world. This, this is also a little bit uh, out of date, um, as I've just been mentioning the different countries. There was something really interesting. I was sent out for a, a dengue epidemic in Hawaii. It was an, an epidemic in a very remote part of the island of Maui. <clears throat> it was actually in a, in a, in a really peculiar um, uh, sort of um, colony of geriatric hippies that were living in, in, in the bush. Um, and there were millions of Aedes albopictus, and it was quite clear that the, the virus, dengue virus, had been introduced when some of the grandchildren of these people <clears throat> went for a culture festival in Tahiti, where there was a massive epidemic going on. So that was very simple. But I went to all the other islands except, uh, I always forget the name of it, um, looking for evidence of other cases. And in fact, there were a couple of, a few cases in Oahu uh, and in Kauai, as you can see in the top left-hand corner. The Kauai one was rather intriguing. There were two people that had dengue, and they didn't seem to have any connection um, with the Maui Islands at all. And then I learned something very interesting. Um, in, on the beaches were the beach bums, at least I thought they were <clears throat> beach bums. They were people who, who essentially were dedicated to, to surfing. And what I learned was that these are, these are not penniless people who spend all their money on surfboards. A lot of them are very wealthy. They have nice parents who give them lots of money. And when the, um, when the waves are up in Samoa, then they jump on a plane and they fly to Samoa, and they surf there, they surf the web, in fact, to find out the, these, uh, these areas. And so when we, um, when we looked, when we isolated virus from uh, Oahu, we found that other the, the, the strain of virus that was circulating was actually similar to one going in Samoa, uh, whereas the one in, in the hippie colony uh, was from Tahiti. So this shows you a little bit about the dispersal of creatures. Back to history. Um, there was a, probably do, the Americans here will know all about um, West Nile virus. Um, this was an, an astonishing um, uh, phenomenon that happened in, in the Bronx <coughs> to begin with in, in New York um, uh, <clears throat> in 1999. Suddenly, two things were happening. First of all, there were um, people being admitted to hospital um, with encephalitis, with an inflammation of the brain, very serious condition. And we at CDC, we, the Centers for Disease Control, we got evidence that it was St. Louis, St. Louis encephalitis, my virus from Memphis, Tennessee. Well, um, we really got egg on our face because it turned out to be West Nile virus, a virus that had never been seen um, in the United States <clears throat> or, in fact, anywhere in the New World. Um, and the spread of this virus was astonishing. That was 1999. The green areas are places where the virus was detected, uh, mainly using my Culex trap. And then the next year it was like that, and the next year it was like that, and the next year it was like that. An astonishing movement across, and by now it's in every state. It sort of fulminates, it goes up and down like these, uh, these uh, viruses do. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of why I believe that happened. Basically, the crows that I showed you, uh, I believe, are the real secret because crows, most of the, many birds were dying and crows eat dying, they, they, they're scavengers. And so they were, and they have a wide <coughs> dispersal every day. So I believe they were carrying the virus. So if we go back to history, uh, this is a very beautiful ship with a terrible, um, a terrible cargo, the slave trade. 
You know about the triangular slave trade where, where ships were going to West Africa, um, getting a hold of people for slavery, uh, taking them across to the Americas, uh, to the Caribbean, to, to, to South America, and then bringing sugar, sugar and other tropical produce to, to Europe. And of course, the, the, the slaves were not uh, sitting in, in, in uh, even in economy class. Um, they were packed into the, in, in, into the uh, holes like this. Underneath them were many barrels of water. Obviously, even slaves needed to drink water. And so the mosquitoes, Aedes aegypti, which is another related species to the Asian tiger, which is the best vector that we have of dengue and chikungunya and, in fact, yellow fever, um, the, the mosquito was breeding on board, uh, very happy in the dark uh, recesses of the, of, the, um, uh, of the ship when they had fed on the, on the, uh, uh, on the slaves and on the crew and on, on, on the officers. And in fact, it was not unusual for uh, ships to arrive with many people having died on the ships because there was, there was transmission of yellow fever on board uh, during the, the voyage. Um, and actually, that's one of the reasons why the quarantine flag is yellow, um, because uh, uh, ships were kept offshore for 40 days um, in order to be quite sure that there wasn't dengue, uh, sorry, yellow fever on board. And so, in fact, you've got yellow fever outbreaks all over the, the, uh, the areas, as you can see, in, in, in the Americas, but also in Europe. Now we're starting to get towards the point. You can see that in various places in Spain, there were very large epidemics. Uh, there were epidemics even in Cardiff in England, uh, in Dublin in, 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 uh, uh, in Ireland. And, and these are obviously not even tropical countries today. Um, the uh, 1878 yellow fever epidemic, which is one of many epidemics in the United States, um, affected, as you see, 19... Uh, 1,500 in Memphis, Tennessee uh, alone. The, the authorities wanted actually some people in, in Indiana, etc., because the, the, the virus had spread as far as there. They wanted essentially the, the city to be bulldozed, to be eliminated um, because of yellow fever. Um, and as you see, 100,000 cases. So basically, what, what I'm saying is that there was a, essentially has been a quantum leap in the mobility of vectors, the mobility of pathogens, and the difficulty of intercepting them. So now I'm going to take you to really exciting stuff, chikungunya. Chikungunya is a very nasty viral disease, a bit like dengue, terrible headaches, high fever, um, uh, bone aches, break bone fever, uh, arthritis in the case of chikungunya. And chikungunya suddenly arrived um, in the Indian Ocean. Chikungunya is one of the many zoonotic diseases, diseases that viruses that, that circulate in nature, in this case in, in wooded, in woodland or forest areas in, in much of uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And um, Presumably, it came from somewhere uh, in, in, in the rainforest, in the forested areas where it's very uh, common. Um, and there's one thing to notice is that Africa is now being crisscrossed with the Pan-African Pan highways. Uh, people are becoming much more mobile. The next thing that happened was that Mombasa and Lamu were, had epidemics, uh, major epidemics. Uh, over there, and the next thing we knew, it was in the Comoro Islands. Obviously, it hadn't flown. The mosquitoes didn't fly there. The virus didn't fly there. Um, they were going by airplane. Then there were massive epidemics in Reunion Island um, and on Mor Mauritius. I went to Mauritius as, as an advisor there, and it looked like something like a third of the population were in agony uh, because of this. And of course, they lost. They reckoned they'd lost 250 uh, million uh, dollars in that, uh, it, it, because the tourist trade was so disrupted. <coughs> and then the next thing was, it was everywhere. It was in India, it was in, in various parts of uh, East African towns, um, and it went all over India, probably, some people estimate, 11 million cases. I mean, in places where, like I was actually until yesterday in, uh, where was I, in Sri Lanka. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and there they've been having a massive epidemic. They've got, uh, so far, 211 deaths, about uh, 40,000 cases. Um, and essentially, uh, uh, they have, in the hospitals, they don't have enough beds. They have three patients per bed. 
So these things are pretty serious. And then it went all over. It went to, to Singapore, it went to uh, Thailand, uh, as you can see, the Philippines, etc. So that was the story of, uh, of the dispersal of, um, of a virus worldwide, uh, as you've seen. And then, boom, suddenly the virus was in, in northern Italy. Italy was heavily infested with my albopictus uh, uh, um, Asian tiger mosquito. Um, and an Indian, who ha there are Indian restaurants in, in, in Italy. Uh, and an Indian had flown over to his uh, family in the restaurant in a small village called Castaglione de Ravenna um, and initiated a really serious outbreak with about, it was a summertime and the summertime in Italy is actually warmer uh, than many places where this is transmitted. Um, and uh, fortunately it had landed there because Rome, for example, is heavily infested with Albopictus, uh, right down to Sicily, uh, etc. So what had happened? You had a world trade in used tires that transmitted a Japanese mosquito to the United States. Um, the exotic mosquito then moved also moved to Europe. The Italians traced their infestation to tires that were exported from Atlanta, Georgia, not very far from our headquarters of CDC in, in Atlanta. Um, and a virus, chikungunya, moved to the coast of East Africa. There were urban epidemics. The chikungunya went then to the Oceanic Islands, Mauritius, and then from there to, to, uh, to India. And then there were urban epidemics in India, a pandemic in Asia, and it arrived in Italy. Okay? So, what was the reason for all this? It's too late. It was global warming. One of the... One of the, the, the guys who, who was my, my principal adversary in, in, in the discussion, and he had a paper published in Emerging Infectious Diseases, a highly respected uh, journal, um, which, in which he said, why was it causing? Well, the Indian Ocean was overheating, um, and so the, the higher temperatures in Africa in Africa, yeah? Um, the higher temperatures had caused all this to happen. Uh, that was Paul Epstein, Harvard Medical School. He often was written up as on the staff of Harvard. I was at Harvard for a couple of years. He was an instructor. He wasn't, uh, uh, he wasn't on the faculty. And Sorry, it was the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, which really incensed me um, because uh, that's the, the journal I respect most in our field. So what he said was chikungunya re-emerged with a vengeance in nations cresting on an overheated Indian Ocean. For Africa, climate change portends much more of such surprises. I mean, this was, I actually had already written to him. Uh, I, I, I wrote a private email to him after a lot of other things that I'll come across. And, and I stu <coughs> stupidly said, you know, Paul, one day people are going to catch up with you. You're just a damn liar. Well, that was a stupid thing to do because he sent that to the director of CDC and a job that I was supposed to have trying to, trying to change the World Health Organization. I, I was uh, dropped from that because of not being diplomatic. Although normally everyone said, well, Paul is diplomatic. So the World Health Organization said, this is the, the, the boss of the World Health Organization for the European region. This is the first case of an epidemic of a tropical disease in a developed European country. Climate change creates conditions that make it easier for this mosquito to survive. The mosquito survives in North Korea, for crying out loud. North Korea, five months of the year, the temperatures are below zero, the average temperatures. Uh, Beijing also has a horrible winter. This mosquito mosquito is adapted to living in, uh, in, uh, in temperate climates. Uh, it, at this time of the year, the eggs are not hatching. They're in diapause. They're in a kind of hibernation. Uh, and, and so that was absolute nonsense. And then what he said really amused me. This is a real issue. This is a statement you can find on, on the thing. It is not something a crazy environmentalist is warning about. You know, that obviously gave it uh, great legitimacy. And then the, 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 the woman who was elected, selected as a lead author uh, of the human health uh, chapter of the fourth assessment report at ICPCC, um, she actually has no scientific credentials. She's never written a, a, a paper in her life. <clears throat> the, other, um, the other lead author um, is a paleocoprolitologist. 
Do everybody know what that is? She, a, a specialist in, um, in, in German would be Scheiße. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 especially um, in, in fossil feces. And he had written five papers. And the, the importance of that is that I was nominated as well, uh, but I was not considered expert enough to, to, to be in the chapter. So what she said was, there is now no chance that it will spread across the mountains from Italy to Germany. The temperature in the mountains is now very low. The mosquitoes are dying off. I mean, I just can't imagine how she could say that to the public. Can you imagine mosquitoes flying over the Alps? I mean, it's ridiculous. So the other thing is that the, 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 uh, the village is in the delta of the river Po, where m malaria was a major problem, was one of the last areas in Europe to be cleared of malaria. So the vectors of these diseases um, are, as you can see, the Airbus. This is how viruses travel. If I, yesterday, uh, b when I left Sri Lanka, if I'd been bitten by an infected mosquito, in 10 days' time, I could infect mosquitoes that bit me. And that could be wherever I went, not here in Germany, but who knows. <laughs> if, if the temperatures increase, yeah, maybe. And, and this is the way that, that the aquatic stages, that the, the tires are being shipped. That the, these are monsters that go across. This is a Chinese ship. And how many mosquitoes could you hide, or how many mosquitoes could you detect in, in those containers? And there are many other examples of introduction. I won't go into the details. Some people in, in imported uh, some camels into uh, the center of France, and they had um, a kind of trypanosomiasis, sleeping sickness, uh, uh, um, uh, organisms, parasites, and they've now spread. It's very, it's very serious. It's spreading to the area where they make Roquefort cheese. It's basically as fatal to, etc., etc. We don't need to go into that. So, in other words, looking back at Charles Darwin's, or, or I should mention the man called Crick, who sent this mosquito with the mollusk attached to his leg, was the great grandfather of Francis Crick. Francis Crick who also uh, uh, contributed to biology. He was the man with James Watson who, who, uh, the, who, who de deciphered the DNA code, also very important. So in other words, the ecology and the behavior of humans, the ecology and the behavior of the vectors, and the, the ecology and, uh, and behavior of the host, I th I've given that twice. Basically, these are the, the factors that affect um, that these are the factors that affect uh, uh, the movement of these viruses. Nothing to do with an overheated Indian Ocean island. I'm going to deal with three of the very common claims on, on, on uh, malaria. The invasion of temperate zones. Malaria um, is coming to uh, the climates as they warm up. Uh, 500 million more cases of malaria in Africa and uh, malaria at high altitudes. One of the questions that, that I... Uh, um, that I, the question I asked in the first session this morning about left wing, right wing, etc. What I really was thinking about is is the the Armageddon instinct. Uh, the maid who who who, um, who cleans my apartment. apartment uh, she's a very nice Ukrainian lady from a little village, and she came to me and said, "Paul, is it really true that?" on the 21st of, November, of December, um, there's an asteroid coming close to the Earth and it's going to be dark for four days. <laughs> uh, how do you answer a question like that from a perfectly nice lady? Um, and, and I think that a lot of the reason that, that there has been all this talk about tropical diseases is because of the kind of the, the, the fear of what happens in darkest Africa, etc. Well, this is Yakutsk. Um, it's, uh, it, it's almost where you can see Alaska from, up in Siberia, in, in, in Siberia, northern Siberia. And these are the data for malaria in Yakutsk um, uh, up until essentially uh, the late 50s when, uh, when the communists managed to uh, get rid of the disease altogether. Um, the whole point about this is that it doesn't matter what the winter temperatures are like. The, the parasite survives in people, the mosquito can survive the winter because it's specially adapted. Um, and when spring comes, it's actually quite warm in those areas. One of the few countries that it's not so warm, the, the 10 degree July isotherm, I think is, is the correct amount, um, is England or parts of or Scotland, and that's no great surprise. But everywhere, and in fact, there was, um, there was malaria in Scotland in the past. 
The, I can give you lots of data on malaria in, in, in Europe, but basically this is one of the big epidemics um, that essentially, as you can see, something like 600,000 deaths, including 30,000 cases of malaria, falciparum malaria, tropical variety in Archangel, um, uh, nearly on, on, well, essentially nearly at the, at the Arctic Circle. And there's lots of other data. This is on Sweden. Um, so really, uh, I was sort of preaching about this for uh, several years, and in the end decided to do a little um, study of my own on, the, uh, on malaria transmission in England, again, not a tropical country, um, during the Little Ice Age. <clears throat> and uh, I went to the, um, uh, the uh, Wellcome Institute for the History of Medicine, and uh, found, or I knew that they were there, found various books in this octavo uh, format um, on agues, which is what it was called in, in uh, malaria was called in England. There's many mentions in Shakespeare. And he, he, this man was not an educated man, and not a very educated, he was an apprentice to an apothecary. And he, um, he uh, studied malaria in the marshes uh, in the Thames estuary around London. So what he did, he was a very clever guy, he, he worked out a, a patented medicine. It was actually, uh, it was actually quinine uh, in white wine. Um, uh, and he actually sold the patent to Louis XIV uh, after he had actually cured the, um, the king in England, Charles II, and he was made Sir Robert Talbot, and then when, it went to, when he cured the Dauphin of France, he was Chevalier Talbot. These are data for, um, uh, uh, for, from churches, from parishes, of deaths from, um, from malaria in marshes and non-marsh areas. The reason that malaria disappeared are very multiple. Ch changes in the environment, the environmentalists should really take note. New crops and new practices for rearing, uh, rearing cattle, mechanization, depopulation of the countryside, so movement, better living conditions, uh, cheaper quinine. Nevertheless, the IPCC state with great confidence the geographic range of malaria is limited to the tropics and subtropics. Well, uh, one of the, the nice quotes I have from about the 1920s was people were asking, why is it that we've been able to get malaria from the south of France, but it still exists in the north of Germany? 111 million more cases in Africa, that is IPCC. Um, I won't talk about stable malaria, all you need to really, because I actually took these slides out yesterday. Um, the fact is the red area is where people get at least one infected bite every year, and up to 300 or, or even maybe 1,000 when they're children. So you can't, the glass is full, you can't pour more water into a glass, okay? Then there's the business of higher altitudes. My friend um, uh, Paul Epstein published in The Lancet, a respected journal, all of these new altitudes where malaria was occurring because of global warming, the altitudes on the y-axis. And these are the historical limits to transmission that were published uh, in, in, until 1945, so quite clearly nonsense. Here is a big scientific uh, American article in which he said the same things. Look at that mountain, and I will show you something later. This guy, uh, I think you probably know about him, um, and he said, for example, Nairobi used to be above the mosquito line, the highest point that with mosquitoes can live. Well, Nairobi, and I know it well, is at 1,600 meters. This is in his book, the... the uh, um, the illustration. He obviously got it straight from uh, Epstein. In fact, he acknowledges Epstein as one of his favorite. You can see that. I can't go back. Anyway, the, it's the, they're the same diagram, more or less. The mosquitoes are the same. The, the, the captions are exactly the same. Uh, he also um, did a book for children. This is uh, the mosquito. He, he, well, the mosqui that m insect is not a mosquito. It's got the uh, proboscis on the wrong end of the mosquito. Uh, and there is a tsetse fly, and he didn't even bother to get a decent specimen. It has only got four legs. So uh, Nairobi was a construction camp. It was, it was built, and it's funny, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's hilarious if it wasn't so pathetic. 
1899. It was very malarious when it was founded. There were five major epidemics. The, 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 the British spe uh, spent a million dollars uh, on trying to control it. And malaria is very rare there today. And in any case, the highlands are very limited. These are the people who speak science to the public and to the media. And we have very little uh, to say in it. This is uh, um, the, the, my own publications compared to the publications of so-called experts. That's C, for example. And this, very quickly, is a, a networking diagram of the eight activists who have most contributed to the, the global warming thing. And you can see there are arrows which, where A wrote a review with B, and then if the arrow's got a two heads on it, then B also wrote with A. In other words, they kept saying, th 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 these are the facts. And in fact, they, they made 110, they, ma they made many, many publications just by exchanging. And this is nearly the end, Wolfgang. These are the, the positions that those people had on the IPCC. So you can see they were major drivers, they were the, they were the people selected for it, and yet all they were doing was publishing each other's rubbish. So, I won't even go into that, there's not time. Th this, is, this is something written by, by um, a, new, uh, uh, a Nobel Prize winning physicist, and this is the last slide. Um, he wrote after the fall of Khrushchev, he wrote, there is nothing more dangerous to science than blind passion. Given support from someone in power, and I'm sure he would have admired Mr. Gore's propaganda, it can lead to suppression of true science, and since science is now a matter of state importance to inflicting great injury on the country.